Welcome back, all my cool cats and kittens, to another episode of Aboutcast. It is your boy, your main man, your future lover, Jordan. And today I'm so, so excited that I'll be able to talk about something that I'm hella passionate about. My boys have been going crazy about this, and finally we've had it. It's been a long await, especially for 2020. We have the final season of Attack on Titan coming out. And we had episode one under the books. And so now I'm going to give you a review on all of the spiciness of the other side of the sea, which was episode 60. So the first episode of the final season of Attack on Titan. So we're not going to get it funky in any given order, but I made some notes about the actual episode and we'll go through that. So, of course, if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, This is a huge, huge, huge spoiler warning, and get off of this, keep it up, of course, Um, but go watch this episode, and then come back, and then listen to this one. So, essentially, what we have here is to set the scene, the first episode back, we're actually on the opposing view side, so we've always been on, you know, Aaron and all of those guys on that island, So I believe the island is specifically called Paradis. And now we're on kind of Marley's turf and Marley's point of view. Specifically, Marley is actually in a war. And this war is against the Mideast Allied Forces. And this war has been going on for about four years. And this is about nine years from the actual happenings of the end of season three from my understanding, just through contextual clues and, of course, uh, you know, obviously like dialogue between characters and whatnot. So essentially what we're dealing with is a totally new cast, totally new people to learn, and a totally new situation to try to understand. But you know how these guys are with Attack on Titan. It is spicy as hell. Um, You know, you're getting dropped dimes left, right, and center. Um, I just watched this episode again. And this is probably my like second and a half to third time watching it and taking some quite diligent notes here. I have picked up a lot of stuff from my first watch to this now. And I've had a few conversations with some people about this, but um, it's still there's a lot, a lot, a lot to take in. So these were some of my notes. So, of course, like I said, this is a war against two nations the Mideast and Allied Forces, and then, of course, we have Marley. So the thing that first kind of piques my interest is these Allied Forces. Number one, this seems like a harken back to World War I, where we had the Allied Forces and Germany fighting um, and all of those things. And I think that this is um, obviously a play on that because there's a lot of like German names and stuff like that. So... Um, No surprises there, but I thought that was an interesting twist that they purposely put in there. Because I think everything is on purpose when it comes to these guys. Because they're just so skilled and talented that every single thing, um, you know, no wasted motion or effort, I believe, on their part. So, the kind of the characters that we're seeing here is, we have a few. So, um, in this war, there's about a handful of people that we actually really get to know. And specifically the people we get to know is Udu, Udo, um, and I don't think he's quite important, um, but he does kind of give us contextual clues about what these people are and how they actually get down. So Udu is um, an actual warrior candidate, and so what that means is that he is um, in the running to possibly be getting the Armored Titan. And once again, remember guys, we have this curse of... I think the it's a, it's like the curse of the Titan. There's a specific name for the curse, but essentially what happens is after 13 years of being a Titan, you die. So, you know, around the 12 year, 12 and a half year mark, you know, these homies are going to say, hey, so you know that Titan power I gave you? Um, I'm going to need it back. And so this is what we're going through. We're looking at the candidates for Reiner's spot as the armored Titan, which is really, really interesting. And the first thing that I, you know, I think the most impactful thing that we see that is another kind of um, see if you can catch me type of move by the Attack on Titan production team and the writing crew is a huge, huge, huge hint on who 
the you know who's going to get a titan power in the future and i think this is portrayed uh quite 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 slickly by the actual like writing in the the anime in the episode itself so uh sliding into that explanation the first thing we kind of see is a guy who is heavily concussed from the war and he is daydreaming talking to the bird saying get out of here it's dangerous and so uh this guy gets grabbed by a dude named colt which is actually this guy's older brother and this guy's we're talking about is named falco so you know number one great nod to super smash bros to all you falco mains out there represent and show some respect for your boy for making it on the big screen changed his thing but he's still representing the birds and all that good stuff so the actual like big hint that we're seeing here is as this dude's heavily concussed um he says some really weird things so the next scene that we see him in essentially is he's surrounded by three of his friends including udu and then we have another girl named gabby which we'll get into in a little bit later but what happens is he's heavily concussed and so they're explaining what's happening in this situation but before that he actually um talks about uh specific contextual things that make me believe that he either might be and so this is going to sound crazy guys but hear me out for a second um not a lot to go off of but um you know you got to get stay ahead of these things and these developments and i think this is going to be a crazier one but i'm thinking this guy falco could possibly be either the person that gets the founding titan's power and as a reminder that is aaron's power or or we're talking about getting the armored titan's power reiner's power so either way we have a huge um you know huge situation and i made a bold claim here so i'm ready to back it up don't have a lot of information but enough so the reason i think either or is when he's kind of you know still in his concussive days he's talking about flying through the air with swords so essentially with um you know the scouting regiment or just kind of normal soldier um odm gear and the swords and talking about titans and then he says i and then get then gets cut off so i mean there's a possibility that it actually might be armin but there's a few reasons why i don't think it's armin one armin isn't with the business necessarily about attacking titans and i believe he was gonna say um that he was about to slice off a nape of that neck so there's only two people that have titan powers and have done that and that's of course reiner and aaron so um those that's obviously the big clue not enough to hang your hat on totally and for me to scream this on the rooftops but enough to drop some of that right here and especially if you want to stay ahead and kind of um this is for posterity's sake of course to say yeah big j was right listen to about cast these homies know what they're talking about so further on um developing characters and stuff like that uh, Gabby is also another really interesting character. She was obviously one of the crew in around Falco's age. And the reason why I think she's so interesting is because she's extraordinarily competent as a soldier and a warrior candidate and is way more qualified than any of the people. And that's even, um, the, to the saying of the actual, her like kind of peers in that sense. And also something really interesting that she says is, um, during this war, she has this kind of um, resolve that um, is pretty intense. Not Aaron intense as far as um, I'm going to kill all these homies like anybody. Not Aaron intense, but um, in a way. So this is an exact quote um, talking about this war specifically. And she was talking about um, this war ending. And she said, I want to slaughter the island of the or slaughter that island of devils who've done nothing but make us suffer and so specifically this seems like her resolve and her character is all about that and then another thing too is that she wants to help all the other Eludians of you know her kind so these are the people that can turn into titans who are treated like um you know i would say below second class citizens uh by the people of marley um, because they're found as dangerous and they're fearful of them. So she really wants to um, represent and raise up the actual, you know, status of her people. And the ways that she can do that is make an exemplary role and being an amazing warrior and soldier and all of that good stuff. So we can already tell that, um, you know, where her 
um, character compasses in a way of like what's driving her and those type of things. So that's actually really interesting that they put that out so quickly within, you know, a couple minutes of this episode going on. And being that it's the first episode, you wouldn't want to put anything that's not important in it because it is so important to have this thing tight and catch everybody up and set the tone for the rest of the episode. So we have that. Um, Colt, who I mentioned briefly of Falco's older brother, there's actually something that is extremely interesting about Colt. Um, He is older and that's cool. No, that's not the cool part. The really, really interesting thing about Colt is that he is already chosen to be the runner or basically the second coming of the beast titan so this is zeke if you guys don't remember from season three and season two uh this homie was wrecking fools as the beast titan that big monkey with the super super long arms that has um you know would put wayne or not wayne gretzky but um shoot i'm forgetting the um diamond back pitcher from back in the day with the sweet mullet and the mustache um, if I, if I think of it, I'm going to say it, but, uh, right now let's keep it pushing, but essentially this dude can throw. Um, and once again, this is nine years after all this business on the Island, uh, the Paradis operations. So we're looking like we need, um, you know, replacements for these guys, like I said before, and there's a really interesting thing as well. So in the actual saving screen, which is around 14.10, as far as 14 minutes, 10 seconds in the episode, you see the kind of the information board like we always see in Attack on Titan. This one's a little bit more interesting because it says something that I think is actually incongruent or um, not particularly right. And so this is it. So essentially it's talking about how Marley is using or seven of the nine Titans as warriors to kind of like go about battle and then it has a few of them and one is the cart titan which we now know has the name of pike and that's the one that kind of uh took zeke away at the end before levi murked that homie smoked that fool and then there's the jaw titan that we saw in the actual trailer leading up to this and that guy's name is gilyard so we have those guys in the background of that um, so we know that those are some of the two, but I was actually listing out the, the rest of the Titans that they could be using as weapons. And as far as humans go, number one, I can only name nine or not nine, but eight. And so either apologies if I'm missing a clear one after I'm saying this list, but, um, I'm just, I'm not sure if I am. So obviously we have jaw, which is Gilliard, cart, which is Pike, the beast Titan, which is Zeke. Um, and then, Um, We actually know something more interesting about Zeke. So Zeke has another power that actually engages um, normal people into being Titans or LEDs being into Titans specifically. And so there was a scene um, in the episode where they were actually dropping human beings um, from an air blimp with parachutes. And then he went outside and yelled, knowing that these humans, they were like non-reactive, almost like in a vegetative state not reacting to the environment or anything like that. He yelled, and they all turned into Titans instantly. So, uh, obviously, this is a power. Um, We've never seen him actually yell to actually engage it, but we've seen, uh, you know, when uh, there was that big standoff with the scouts and everybody trying to close up that, uh, I think, Wall Maria, um, they just instantly appeared, and maybe there was a yell there. But um, we actually see it explicitly in this moment. So that is something to be added to. But back to the list, we have obviously the jaw, the cart, the beast that we just talked about, Zeke. And then we have the armor titan. And we are at four, right? So we're at four titans so far. So the other ones that I can name is Annie. So that's five, who is a female titan with the hardening ability that we've seen in season one. And hasn't came back since. And we are certain that she is still in control of the Paradis. Because it was mentioned by a commander during the war. That they lost the Colossal and the female Titan. The Colossal being that that was Berthold. Who is now Armin's ability as as far as the Colossal Titan goes. And 
Then we also have the founding Titan, which is Aaron. And then we have Ymir. And I'm not sure exactly what Ymir's name is, but number one, that's eight. And then also that means that um, if I can only name eight and Annie, Armin, and the founding Titan are away, that means that I can only name five that they could control. So there's a little bit of discrepancy in that, um, but I'm really curious to see what other Titans they have. I mean, if they just pulled out the Jaw Titan like that, I'm sure that there's some other ones. But anyway, that's where we got on that one. So discrepancy, be willing and ready to be surprised on that front. So obviously, we talked about how this is nine years in the future and a little bit about specifically the the people that they're fighting. So these allied forces, they have uh, quite a bit more advanced technology. And I think this is just kind of the way that the nations kind of rock. Um, some lean on like Marley, obviously heavily leans on Titans. And that's why they went out of their way to try to get Aaron back to have the founding Titan, who was the OG. And I think this is kind of um, the way that we had... Uh, an advancement in technology so a country or you know type of people will dominate for a certain amount of time and then once technology comes and elevates that then other countries come to play and so I think this is what's happening in the waning and the kind of the um, death throes of Marley so I think that this country might get a little bit more desperate knowing that um, you know they're fighting close calls but anyway so with this, there's a few things to note about this war. One, um, they're fighting, uh, a, you know, a different country. And that means that um, they look a little bit different. So not the normal Germanic, like blonde hair, brown hair type features. These people have a little bit darker um, complexion and skin. And interestingly enough, there's some times where they actually speak a different language all, the, all together. So... There's been scenes where the Mideast war or the Mideast army, Allied Forces army, um, will be talking. We get actual like subscripts and uh, those things. And then there was one particular scene where it shows Falco's um, compassionate side and empathetic side where he's actually following the rules of engagement and trying to um, stop one of the Mideast allied forces, or I'm just going to say Mideast guys, um, you know, from bleeding out and dying. One, this is something that nobody else would have done. Gabby was looking down on him for that, thinking that she was trying, he was trying to get the edge by following the rules. Um, but she is sh almost a sure shot for the armor Titan job. Um, but once again, that is contradictory to my hypothesis. But anyway, so during that scene, the actual injured warrior from the opposing side was talking and uh, we weren't getting subtext but I think that maybe this was the reason was was to actually paint the picture a little bit better of what's actually happening so they clearly speak different languages and then what happens was Udu um, the you know the very first guy that I actually talked about um, he is an interpreter so number one that means that the warrior candidates have different skill sets and skills I'm not sure why they do that um, but they you know you know given different things so this guy apparently knows the language of the warring army that they've been fighting for four years and um, this guy as Falco is trying to take care of him calls them devils and that if he touches him he will then kind of kind of contaminate him which is um, shows the disdain of these people against the um, the Marleys or the Eludines specifically. And um, also uh, interesting that there's so much complexity as far as technologically, as far as language, as far as looks. Um, obviously, they're all humans. But once again, we're kind of seeing the more worldly side of Attack on Titan here right now with just the difference of everything. Um, and so there's a few other things that I want to talk about. And one is kind of the elephant in the room, and it is the animation. So, of course, we know that there's a new animation house that is taking care of the Attack on Titan juiciness. And this I find quite interesting as far as um, it's definitely noticeable that it's not kind of the, the things that we're used to. Not that it's bad, but I think that it's a, I think, um, a little bit more CGI, which I'm not too much of a fan of. 
especially since it comes off as slightly distracting to me. And maybe, you know, I'm just a stickler for the old school and you guys can reach out and say, hey, dude, you're totally wrong. This stuff is sick. But I did notice that and I was like, mm, that's pretty weak. Um, and then another thing, too, that I noticed is that there's as far as language goes, um, it could just be the the Mid East Army's just choice of like cultural choice of language and stuff like this, or this could just be being ped- being pedantic. But um, at one point, the guys say instead of "son of a bitch," they say "son of a whore," which I find kind of one kind of clunky. I mean, maybe I'm just kind of a sailor, and I um, you know I wouldn't blush away from using "son of a bitch," but I found it a little bit weird that they made that choice instead of you know the holes being bored or the people being eaten it's the language thing so maybe that was just kind of an odd one but anyway um, at the very end um, one thing that I think was underplayed was the fact that Reiner got messed up this homie got wrecked and um, it was like a slight and momentary shock by the people around this homie took a whole bunch of shells for Zeke being that Zeke is obviously not the most robust Titan. And, um, I think it's probably more of a utility than Reiner himself, as far as the Titan ability and stuff goes. So anyway, he jumped in the middle of some army or some Navy battleship shells and wrecked him to save Zeke. And I'm not sure if he's all right. It didn't, I'm not sure if he got hit in the nape in the neck or not, but I guess we'll see in the next episode. And, um, yeah, so I think that kind of surmises the first episode. A lot of interesting things in there. Obviously, we have some really big players in Falco, Colt. I'm really interesting, interested to see his character development a little bit more, and then obviously more of the Marley and, st- and stuff like that. So, essentially, what we did was we finished a whole four year war or had a cap to it in one day, as far as a whole bunch of crazy things, and the country or the the continent of Marley is feeling pretty hyped at this moment. And of course, they're giving the credit to the Marleyan soldiers. And there's another thing too, kind of a frazzle brain, but um, there's, you'll notice like two different types of bands. One is silver, one is yellow. Uh, yellow are warrior candidates from my understanding. There's nothing explicit that says this. It's just me just picking up contextual clues and whatnot. And of course, this is all for the LEDs, not the actual Marleans because they don't have bands um, because they are treated as normal. So there is one thing. And then the next episode, what we're going to see is how people, you know, them traveling back home and kind of enjoying themselves and stuff like that for the moment. But, um, you know, I'm sure that there'll be drama in this next one, but I think it'll be a lot more like character building and stuff like that. But anyway, anyway, uh, this is your boy spitting off the top of the head talking about the amazing first episode of the final season of Attack on Titan, my favorite TV series, and maybe even, um, you know, televised anything. And um, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. You know, if um, you guys really enjoyed this, we actually did a character breakdown of Irwin or Aaron Smith, Irwin Smith on a couple episodes of podcasts ago. And and, uh, that was really well received by the Attack on Titan fans. So don't be afraid to hop in and check that out. Reach out to us on everything. Um, Once again, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Uh, If this was a little bit out of the wheelhouse for you guys, well, um, you know, we have a leadership um, breakdown of Miyamoto Musashi coming up here soon, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.